are looking at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, the principal propulsion laboratory for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Lewis was established in 1941 as part of the former National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. During the critical 20-year period since, Lewis scientists and engineers have made many significant contributions to our nation's aircraft and spacecraft. During and immediately following the war, efforts were concentrated on the piston type or reciprocating engine. Then in the mid-40s and early 50s came the urgent quest for sustained supersonic speeds through research on turbojet, ramjet, and rocket engines. And over the past several years, there has been intensive research on advanced rocket, nuclear, and electric engines for space travel. With the establishment of the NASA in 1958, the center's research emphasis moved from aviation to space technology. Consequently, the entire staff faced the task of adapting older aircraft research facilities so that they could be made useful to the relatively new science of space technology. The present quickly became the past, and the urgent need to bring the future into the present became a constant challenge. The Lewis Altitude Wind Tunnel is a typical example of an aircraft type facility that has been altered to accept more current research programs. The Altitude Wind Tunnel, or AWT for brevity, has been the scene of important research accomplishments during the past two decades. It is designed not only to provide simulation of aircraft speeds, but also by use of its enormous vacuum equipment, it can create its own atmosphere, which parallels environmental conditions that are found at 90,000 feet, a space atmosphere. The AWT was initially built to simulate altitude conditions normally encountered by aircraft at 50,000 feet. A giant fan here circulates air up to speeds of 400 miles per hour, while simultaneously vacuum pumps raise the tunnel's altitude from ground level to 50,000 feet. Also, since high altitude air is much colder, this refrigeration equipment cools the circulating air to provide a more realistic altitude simulation. This was the AWT in 1943, and almost immediately it was put to work to improve the performance of World War II combat aircraft. The tunnel made its first vital contribution by solving a cooling problem that was affecting the operation of B-29 engines. Bomber pilots reported that at high altitudes, their engines were overheating and losing power. B-29 engines were mounted in the AWT's test chamber and taken up to high altitude. Following intensive study, Lewis engineers determined accurately that following redesign of engine baffles, the cooling problem would be solved. They were right, and history records the mighty accomplishments of our B-29 aircraft in the Pacific War. And then after a short year of use for piston engines for which it was designed, came the first change. Turbojet engines had entered the field of aircraft propulsion, and with a great list of problems. These engines, gulping great quantities of air, needed larger inlet ducts in which achieving an even distribution of flow was a serious problem. Our country's first jet airplane, the Bell YP-59A, as well as the F-80, a turbojet fighter, took their turns respectively in the test chamber of the tunnel. Aviation experts were concerned over the fact that these early jet aircraft suffered from unequal distribution of airflow. Following checkout at tunnel speeds up to 400 miles per hour, engineers redesigned jet engine inlets for a more equal distribution of airflow. Result, a power plant with about 25% greater efficiency. During the course of these studies, it was discovered that the early jet engines had serious flame-out difficulties, wherein combustion would cease at operational altitudes above 30,000 feet. Altitude wind tunnel tests established the flame-out limits of these engines, and subsequent modification of their combustion systems raised operational altitudes 10 to 20,000 feet. In the late 1940s came the demand for supersonic speeds, and here resourceful engineers and scientists received another big challenge, which was to be met by a redesign of the tunnel's capabilities. And so the metamorphosis of Lewis's altitude wind tunnel began. The sound barrier has been broken again and again, and now the speed capability of the tunnel has to be increased to beyond 700 miles per hour. Engineers and scientists, after much study, discovered that by taking advantage of pressure differences between the outside air environment and those created by altitude simulation, they could provide enough pressure to simulate speeds 
to one and two times the speed of sound. The only sacrifice involved here was the reduction of the effective test section from an area large enough to accommodate nearly an entire airplane configuration to one large enough to test a typical propulsion engine. The redesign was accomplished in the nick of time because now the Korean War was well underway and jet pilots from that conflict reported difficulty in their efforts to outclimb the enemy. Lewis engineers had already developed the afterburner or tailpipe burner originally proposed by the Germans. This know-how, plus added successful research effort, so improved the Sabre afterburner that shortly our jet pilots had no trouble in outperforming the Red MiGs at high altitudes. Jet engine improvements continued, but by 1957, with the refinement of ramjet propulsion systems, the AWT had virtually completed its research role in the field of jet propulsion systems. In October of 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was created by an act of Congress, and the former National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics became the framework of this new research organization. The Lewis staff quickly transferred their efforts to research on space propulsion problems. Among other facilities, they designed and built a multiple-axis spin rig for research on spacecraft controls. The potentiality of this rig for acquainting Project Mercury astronauts with orientation and control problems in space was quickly recognized, and here it is being gyrated by an astronaut. The location, once again, the now venerable altitude wind tunnel. Before this scene became reality, further modifications of the giant facility were required in order to provide a realistic space environmental altitude simulation to equal environmental conditions found at 100,000 feet. The modification was accomplished successfully by increasing the AWT's vacuum potential by use of more elaborate and powerful pumps. Of course, the upstream section of the tunnel was ideal for placement of the giant gimbal rig. During the early part of 1960, all seven astronauts received lengthy indoctrination aboard the flying device. Each astronaut was deliberately spun out of equilibrium and was then required to sense and control the motion of his craft in a given period of time. And this is precisely what Alan Shepard did during his flight into space on May 5, 1961. The altitude wind tunnel received further adaptation so that the job for Project Mercury could be accomplished efficiently and on time. These are scenes of actual capsule separation, precisely as it will happen during a space flight. For this research program, the tunnel's full altitude potential was used. The cameras record the scene remotely at a simulated altitude of nearly 100,000 feet. This will be the scene at Cape Canaveral shortly. One of the astronauts rides the Project Mercury capsule on its first orbital flight atop the Atlas launching vehicle. This is the payoff of some of the research accomplishments performed at the AWT. But this metamorphosis of the AWT continues so that the Lewis staff of engineers, scientists, and physicists may solve the problems related to programs which come after Project Mercury. In 1961, the first Centaur, featuring upper stages, powered by Lewis-developed high-energy fuels, will be launched from Cape Canaveral. This leads to the great Saturn, also equipped with high-energy Lewis fuels for upper stages. And then will come the launching of instrumented electric propulsion rockets, a notable Lewis achievement. These include miniature nuclear reactors for power sources, and it is likely that the AWT will continue its role as an Earth-bound space laboratory where propulsion systems may be tested at space altitudes. <laughs>